Welcome to the Global Treasures Podcast. I'm Abigail Vaca. And I'm Keith Berthew. We're two wayfarers with a passion for traveling and exploring the incredible sights left behind by our ancestors. We'll spend each episode exploring these places, their history, the stories, the people who built them, restored them, and who now save them for all our benefit. So in case this is the first episode you've had the chance to listen to, or have never heard of the United Nations, we'll start by sharing a bit about what they do as an organization. The United Nations is a global organization made up of 193 participating countries that was founded in 1945 to bring together the world's nations to discuss issues around security, human rights, climate change, and other global issues to work together to find common solutions. One of the bureaus within the United Nations is UNESCO, which stands for the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. It was created to encourage the identification, protection, and preservation of cultural and natural heritage around the world considered to be of outstanding value to humanity. What makes the concept of World Heritage Sites really unique is the idea that these places belong to all people across the globe, no matter where they physically live. This agency provides emergency assistance to sites in imminent danger, protects the properties by providing training to staff that curate and work on the site, and encourages new sites to be nominated for the future. There are currently 1,157 sites across the world, with more being added every year. This ensures that we will not run out of amazing episodes to bring you. Throughout our journey exploring these sites, we're going to release episodes in the order by year the sites were originally added to the UNESCO list, starting with the first ones in 1978. With the introduction out of the way, let's dive in. episode, Keith and I will be introducing you to Aachen Cathedral, which was incorporated into the UNESCO site list in 1978. It was one of the first 12 UNESCO World Heritage Sites and the first German cultural monument to be added to the list. Aachen Cathedral is a beautiful historic cathedral located in western Germany in a city of the same name, Aachen. It's one of the oldest continuously used buildings in Germany. At the heart of the church contains the marble throne of Charlemagne, as well as a Romanesque gilded shrine that now contains his remains. I think that it is important to start with a little of the history of the area that this church was constructed in, so that we can get an idea of why this church is so culturally important. Way back in the Neolithic period, which is about 4300 BCE to 2000 BCE, flint was mined in the area around present-day Aachen. And with the thermal baths in this location, the Romans established Aachen as a spa and a health resort. One of the hottest springs north of the Alps is actually found here, and it's at roughly 160 degrees Fahrenheit. The story of Aachen Church starts with a man named Charlemagne, and you can't do the history of this cathedral without first doing at least a little history of Charlemagne. Charlemagne was a medieval emperor who ruled a majority of Western Europe from 768 to 814. He became king of the Franks, who were a Germanic tribe in present-day Belgium, France, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and Western Germany. He was a tremendous military strategist, who spent much of his life in war to achieve his goals of first unifying the Germanic peoples into one kingdom, converting his subjects to Christianity, and conquering the Lombards, the Avars, Bavaria, and many others. In 800, Pope Leo III crowned Charlemagne Holy Roman Emperor, During this time, Charlemagne encouraged the Carolingian Renaissance, which was a time of cultural and intellectual revival in Europe. When he died in 814, his empire encompassed much of Western Europe. Today, he's often referred to as the father of Europe. He has served as a source of inspiration for leaders throughout history who have had goals to rule a unified Europe. Charlemagne started to build his Faust Palace in 790s, 
and I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, with the dream of making Aachen a new Rome, and work continued until his death in 814. Part of this construction was a church that was designed as an octagon according to the example of Byzantine palace churches, and Charlemagne called this church the Church of St. Mary. I also want to mention, as a way of thanks, Pope Leo III crowned Charlemagne Holy Roman Emperor on December 25, 800, at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. The foundation stone for the church was laid in between 793 and 798 Common Era over the remains of a Roman thermal complex and on the site of a Merovingian chapel. The altar of St. Mary's Church was placed in the same position it had been in the Merovingian chapel, but its orientation was changed. It was actually rotated 38 degrees in an easterly direction, and none of my research I could find out why this was done. With the scope of this church and design, Charlemagne brought experts from all over the empire to Aachen to plan and build the immense project. The floor plan is based on a system of measurements referenced to in the Book of Revelation. When the octagonal church was completed and consecrated in 805, the height of its interior was more than 102 feet, and that was a unique architectural achievement at the time. The palace chapel became the burial place of Charlemagne upon his death in 814. From 936 onwards, the chapel has been used as the coronation place for 30 German kings and 12 queens for the following 600 years until 1531. So in 1000, Otto III had Charlemagne's vault opened. Otton of Lomeo, and I don't know if I'm saying that right either, one of the courtiers who went in with him recorded this event and is reported in the Chronicle of Novalicia, which was written in about 1026. The account reads the following. So we went in to Charles. He did not lie as the dead otherwise do, but sat if he were living. He was crowned with a golden crown and held in his gloved hands a scepter. The fingernails had penetrated through the gloves and stuck out. Above him was a canopy of limestone and marble. Entering, we broke through this. Upon our entrance, a strong smell struck us. Kneeling, we gave Emperor Charles our homage and put in order the damage that had been done. Emperor Charles had not lost any of his members to decay, except only the tip of his nose. Emperor Otto replaced this with gold, took a tooth from Charles's mouth, walled up the entrance to the chamber, and withdrew again. Did they embalm him? I mean, how did his body stay intact or so well preserved? We, well, or at least I am not sure. My research was inconclusive on this point. I am guessing that perhaps there was little moisture in the tomb and the body was preserved as a result. In 1002, Emperor Otto III was also buried in the chapel. Since the Gothic period, every seven years, large numbers of pilgrims make the journey for the, and boy, you're going to have to forgive me for this one, Legantum's fart or holy pilgrimage in order to pay reverence to the four sacred relics. These relics include the dress in which Mary gave birth to the Son of God, the swaddling clothes of the baby Jesus, the loincloth that Christ wore on the cross, and the cloth in which St. John the Baptist's head was placed after his beheading. In the 12th century, Charlemagne's body was placed in a sarcophagus made of marble. The bones lay here until 1215, when Frederick II had them put in a casket of gold and silver. In 1215, he asked the Pope for his canonization. Most of his remains are still in the shrine to this day. During the 15th century, most of the chapels that surrounded the central building were built. In 1656, the Great Fire of Aachen seriously damaged the church, and the roof and the tower including the bells were destroyed. The financial troubles at the time only allowed for a temporary restoration. Then, in the early 18th century, Aachen was revived as a renowned spa town. Later, in 1794, Napoleon occupied the city of Aachen, and it then belonged to France from 1801 till 1815. During this time, the church suffered damage from looting, such as the removal of the 32 ancient columns from the Hochmuster and the dismantling of the lead roofs. For the first time, under Napoleon's rule, Aachen became an Episcopal town. The complete restoration of Aachen began in the 19th century and saw some major changes to the church. Based on a drawing from 1699, painter and architect Baro de Bethune created the design for the dome, which was completed in 1881, and depicts Christ on a throne and the 24 elders surrounding him. 
In 1930, Aachen got its own bishop and became a cathedral rather than a church, so the idea that this is a cathedral is more modern. Later, I'll cover more about the history as we talk about the Restoration in more current times. The cathedral was originally the Palatine Chapel of Charlemagne's Palace in Aachen. At the time of its construction, it was the largest church north of the Alps. It is an eight-sided octagon building. The core of the cathedral was influenced by the St. Vitale in Ravenna. The mosaics show this influence, even though these are 18th century editions and not true to the original. The center octagon is 31.5 meters, or about 103 feet high, and for two centuries this was the highest dome in Europe north of the Alps. It is constructed in the Carolingian style, which is the name given to the distinctive architecture and imperial culture of Charlemagne, which is sometimes called the Carolingian Renaissance. As always, we would encourage you to look at a picture or two of Aachen Cathedral on the internet if you're not driving, which will make the descriptions come alive. So I know that the cathedral has had numerous additions throughout history. Could you talk a little bit more about the original structure? Of course, I would love to. So the upper floor, which is called the Hochmunster, has tall arcs, and the upper church was actually linked by a passage to Charlemagne's palace complex next to the church, which is actually now the present town hall. The upper level holds the throne of Charlemagne, which can only be seen by a guided tour. The chapels are mostly Gothic additions that were added later. The main entrance to this part of the church is through the west side. The second level of the octagon has eight arches with ancient pillars brought from St. Gerion in Cologne, and maybe some other ancient sites as well. They're purely decorative, and Napoleon actually had the pillars taken out and transported to Paris. Most were returned to Aachen later on, but a few are still in the Louvre and are replaced in Aachen by modern copies. There's also an unusually large amount of gold in this church, while the Byzantine-style mosaics add a lot of color to an otherwise fairly dark building. So you said there's an unusually large amount of gold in this church. To quote the philosopher Justin Bieber, what do you mean? Yeah, it's an unusually large amount of gold compared to other churches, and serves to illustrate just how rich and powerful Charlemagne was. Got it. You also mentioned the mosaic a couple times. For the listeners who aren't familiar with the term, could you just briefly explain what a mosaic is, please? Yeah, sure. A mosaic is a picture or a pattern produced by arranging together small pieces of some hard material that are different colors. This is usually something like stone, tile, or glass. There also is a huge ring chandelier hanging in the center of the octagon, which is stunning. This was donated by Stouffer Emperor Frederick I Barbarossa otherwise known as Redbeard, and it dates from 1170. This circular chandelier symbolizes heavenly Jerusalem. This is one of only four surviving ring chandeliers in Germany, while at least 37 are known to have existed. Some of the locations of the other chandeliers are UNESCO World Heritage Sites as well. The centerpiece of this magnificent church is the marble throne of Charlemagne, where 30 German kings and 12 queens have been crowned. The throne is on the second level and was installed around the year 800 to the specifications set forth by Charlemagne himself. Contrasting the rest of the church, this throne has not been altered since. This is referred to as the Achener Kongnixthron, or the Royal Aachen Throne, or even just Karl's Throne, which is Charles's throne. The royal throne looks simple and doesn't have much decoration, but every aspect has unique symbolic, religious, or political significance. So the main part of the throne is four white marble slabs. It's currently actually yellowish brown due to stains from a tar substance that protected but discolored it during the Second World War. On the back of the throne is a very early drawing of the crucifixion of Christ. Research has confirmed that the marble floor stones were brought all the way from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Even though that is a long way to bring the stones, again, it was all about the symbolism. The most important symbol was the purse of St. Stephen. That is now in Vienna with the rest of the imperial's insignia. It was believed that this early 9th century purse reliquary contains sand stained by the blood of St. Stephen, the first Christian martyr. As a result, the new German king literally sat on holy ground when being crowned. You're going over my head with some of these terms. What's a reliquary? 
Yeah, a reliquary is a container for a part of a deceased holy person's body or belongings kept as an object of holy reverence. There will be lots of mention of relics throughout this episode. Okay. Uh, I admit, I didn't know anything about Charlemagne before researching for this episode. I'm curious to hear a bit more about the throne itself. Yeah, the history of this piece of furniture is truly remarkable. So the throne is mounted on four pillars, making a narrow passage underneath. During the Middle Ages, pilgrims would pass underneath on their knees. I wouldn't suggest trying it nowadays. There'll be some really nice guides that may have something to say about those actions. So, this crawling was done for a whole bunch of reasons, including Charlemagne being considered a saint by some, and also as a sign of humility. Underneath, you can actually see polished stone on the inside of the pillars as a result of many, many visitors crawling underneath. The steps leading to the throne were recycled from pillars brought back from Jerusalem. Some presume from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, but some sources have them from the Palace of Pilate, where Jesus walked on his final hours before his crucifixion. Six steps lead to the royal seat, which is supposed to represent the six steps Jesus climbed to Pontius Pilate's throne after he was whipped. This isn't the only Christian symbolism in this throne room, however. So this throne is undisputedly one of the most culturally important objects in German history, then. Uh, I also want to talk a bit about the choir that was added later on. Starting in 1355, with construction being completed and finished in 1414, the choir of Aachen Cathedral is considered a masterpiece of Gothic architecture. It has a massive glass surface, and has actually been nicknamed the Aachen Glass House as a result. The glass that's present is more modern, however, as the original was destroyed, unfortunately, during World War II and had to be replaced. And I'll touch on this again later in the episode. Inside this part of the building, there are two huge early 13th century gilded shrines. One, which as mentioned earlier, contains the remains of Charlemagne. The second, also mentioned earlier, is referred to as the Mary Shrine, and the four relics within are shown every seven years, with the last showing in 2021. It is considered one of the most important late Romanesque artworks still in existence. This shrine is full of symbolism of Charlemagne's power. So on the front panel, Charlemagne is placed between Pope Leo II and the Bishop of Reims, traditionally the spot for Christ in works of the same type. Even though Charlemagne sits on a throne between them, he still towers over the two religious leaders. Christ appears on a medallion above Charlemagne, and the message is clear. Charlemagne, and thus the Holy Roman Emperor, is the chosen representative of God on earth. Now I want to talk a bit about the protections for the site itself, since we touched on some of the damage that the church has experienced over time. In terms of how the cathedral is being taken care of, I'm going to start in the 1940s, since the history is just so long and drawn out. The main reason I thought it would be interesting to start here is because the cathedral was heavily damaged during World War II. The city of Aachen, and by default the cathedral, was heavily damaged by Allied bombing attacks and artillery fire, but the basic structure survived. Many of the art objects had been removed to secure storage during the war, thankfully. Starting in 1949, It took two years to repair the choir windows alone after they were destroyed. On top of the windows, a choir hall, an altar, and the Holiness Chapel were damaged beyond repair. Reconstruction and restoration have taken place intermittently for over 30 years and have cost an estimated 40 million euro. They have an actual restoration workshop in the cathedral itself to help protect and upkeep the over 3,000 works and artifacts owned by the cathedral and the Catholic Church. More recently, 22 million euros were spent to overhaul the cathedral in the 1990s, including the redesign of the treasury in 1995. And in the 2000s, exterior, interior, and basement renovations were completed with the cleaning and conservation of the mosaics in the octagon. According to the cathedral's architect, it cost around 35 million euros. Now, I want to pivot a bit because I always like to include the weather and some information about the city itself for those who are interested in traveling here. Aachen is the westernmost city in Germany. It has humid weather, mild winters, and warm summers, with a good amount of rainfall throughout the year. 
The average temperature in January is about 37 degrees Fahrenheit or 3 degrees Celsius, while the summer will get up to as high as 80 degrees Fahrenheit or a little over 18 Celsius. Actually, that sounds a lot like the weather up here in New England. What's the government in the surrounding area like? The local government is run by a mayor with a city council. Aachen is also noted as having one of the largest medical facilities in Europe, Clinicum. Aachen is also considered to be the administrative center for coal mining in Germany, as well as a center for production of electric cars. And now my favorite question, and of course one of the main reasons I travel. What's the food like in the area if I were to go there? In terms of the local cuisine, specialties include Aachner Printen, which is a gingerbread made with beet sugar. And then there's also something called Aachner Lieberwurst, which is a Christmas sausage made with cream, spices, and honey. And both sound pretty good, actually. They also have an annual sausage competition for the best Lieberwurst, but I don't know that I see us planning any of our trips to coincide with that. (laughs) Well, not yet, at least. Aachen City Council, if you're listening, both of us would love you to fly us out there, and we promise to say many wonderful things about your city in the podcast. Just saying. All right, so if one were to travel to Aachen, what's the transportation situation like? Much like any other large European city, they're connected to seemingly efficient public transportation, both the rail line and bus line. I'd also note that there's a new rail line currently being built that's going to link Aachen to Liege, Belgium, and Maastricht in the Netherlands, which will likely boost tourism to the area. This means more foot traffic, but also more money from visitors to help upkeep the cathedral. And we didn't mention this before, but if you're interested in taking a tour of the cathedral, tickets can only be purchased in a small shop across from the cathedral on the day of, not in advance. The tickets cost around 5 euros at the time of this recording, and the tour lasts about 45 minutes. This is the only way to see the throne and the choir. There's usually one tour in English during the day and the afternoon, and the rest are in German. So what does the city look like in terms of the people who live there? In terms of demographics in the area, as of 2021, the population was about 250,000. It's considered to be a technical hub with the leading university of technology, KWTH, in Germany. As a result, 13.6% of their population is foreign-born residents who are there for higher education. In terms of religion, about 50% of the population is Roman Catholic, and it's been noted to have a very low crime rate. I thought an interesting fact was Anne Frank's mother, Edith Frank, was actually born here. Listeners of this podcast will quickly realize that Abigail loves to investigate the alternate histories and conspiracy theories that surround these UNESCO sites. Knowing these also makes it much more fun to visit these sites, as it gives you some more interesting things to look for while you're there. Abigail, what have you uncovered in your investigations into Aachen Cathedral? So, I was only able to uncover two conspiracy theories, or anything remotely urban legend-esque. And that was regarding the symbol of the all-seeing eye, which is on the gate of Aachen Cathedral. It has a very Dan Brown feel. The all-seeing eye, which is also known as the Eye of Providence, is a human eye inside of a pyramid or triangle that looks like it's surrounded by rays of sunshine. For those who have seen a US $1 bill, you're familiar with this symbol. And if you haven't seen one, you can just do a quick Google search. This is a symbol that's frequently used by the Freemasons, which is an all-male-run organization that's very secretive, and not much is really known about what they do. Some people believe that this symbol, being on the gate, means that they were working with the Catholic Church to fight the German nationalists, especially during the 1930s and 40s when Hitler was in power. The membership is primarily Caucasian Protestants, though, so it's pretty unlikely that this is the case. But why this belief has gained some traction is because the Nazis actually hated the Freemasons and believed that they were on the same level as Jewish citizens in their eyes, whom they obviously were trying to exterminate throughout the Holocaust. However, I'd also note that this symbol has been used by the Catholic Church since about the 8th century, at least 800 years plus before the Freemasons were even founded, so I think this one can be easily debunked. Wow, that does sound like a Dan Brown novel. 
So when I was investigating the history of this site, I came across something very interesting about the 1,200-year-old bronze doors in the western facade. What's the story there? Oh, you must be referring to the finger of the devil, which was the second thing I wanted to bring up. So there are magnificent bronze doors, original from the time of Charlemagne, and they were moved to this entrance from the original entrance of the chapel. These doors are known as the Wolf's Door and they have two lion heads. Inside the mouth of one of the lions, it's possible to feel the finger of the devil. I'm using finger quotes here. It looks just to be a piece of bronze that's kind of supporting the lion's head. But according to legend, the devil helped to build the church in exchange for the soul of the first one to enter the church. And he was expecting the soul of the bishop. But a wolverine was chased in, and the devil broke off his finger when he slammed the door in anger. According to tradition, anyone who can remove the finger of the devil from the mouth of the lion will be awarded a golden cloak. Ooh, a golden cloak. Now that sounds like a nice bonus upon a visit. So I wonder if they'll let me try to remove it with power tools. <laughs> well, with the wealth of history, symbolism, and cultural significance, it is completely obvious why this site was chosen as part of the first class of 12 sites in 1978 to be incorporated in the first site in Germany. As always, and with any World Heritage site, if you want to support the upkeep of this marvel, you can make a donation to UNESCO World Heritage Online. The other, and even more important way that you can support these sites is by visiting them. It's a double bonus. You get to see these incredible sites, and support them at the same time. It's what we hope you do, and the main reason that we are so passionate about UNESCO sites, and also why we want to share them with you. Thank you for listening to the Global Treasures Podcast. If you would like to support the show, you can subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. See you next time.